morning, everyone. Matt Reed here with ITS. Welcome to our uh, webinar today. We're going to talk about um, a couple of, of, of giants in the marketplace uh, today, Microsoft and, and Symantec, a modern approach to securing user and devices. Just a, a quick, uh, uh, quick about ITS here. We are we're headquartered in, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, we are a Microsoft Gold partner as well as a Semantic Platinum partner. Uh, we're a national company. We we operate uh, in 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 all 50 states. Do a little bit of international business, and we also work with about 15% of the Fortune 500. Within that, some of the largest uh, healthcare, retail, uh, finance, and and government agencies uh, that are out there. Some examples of some recent thought leadership uh, that you may be interested in. You can find these on our website uh, or find them through our social feeds. A lot of great information here. Uh, the seven doctrines of I, uh, productive IT management. That's kind of the combined super story of ITS. We also have some really great papers around systems management, um, uh, uh, threat paper, as well as a paper on uh, uh, data loss prevention. So our agenda today, uh, I'm going to set the stage with a, with a brief IT uh, security history. Uh, I'm joined by a uh, peer on the systems management practice here at ITS, Troy Whitaker. And he's going to cover some, some really good information around Microsoft and some interesting things that are going around with Windows and how customers are, are buying these solutions. And then I'm going to uh, bring us home and talk a little bit about uh, reducing costs with, uh, with best of breed security. Troy is going to talk about systems management stuff and productive systems management. And uh, go ahead and proceed, Troy. We're living in this world, and just a, just a little quick, real quick history on, on, on me and my background. I've, I've got about 20 years of IT experience. Um, I started on the, on the analyst side, went into consulting in the 90s went uh, into the channel and then went into the vendor space for a little bit over a decade and now find myself back at, uh, at, at, at the channel, in the channel, working at ITS. I've been with the company for uh, just over three years now and there's been some interesting things that, that have been occurring in the last uh, just over a decade and, and I'd like to share some of these things with you right now. So if we're looking at, at, at different aspects of, of IT from people to the threats to the devices or the types of systems, you know what we're focusing on uh, uh, in the industry as far as what we're protecting and what we're trying to be mindful of, as well as uh, being cognizant of the information. Some interesting things have happened back in the late '90s when when I moved from a from an analyst into the consulting world. Um, IT ruled with a fist, right? I always like to. Uh, 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 mentioned the the Saturday Night Live skit with Jimmy Fallon about Nick Burns, your computer guy, uh, and that was the guy that I worked for in my first my first uh, you know first analyst job in IT. Move, <laughs> move, <laughs> exactly. So um, you know IT ruled at that time. Uh, we we ruled the kingdom. Uh, the threats at the time were were very much garden variety. Uh, the hacking and the and the malware was largely aimed at uh, notoriety and about graffiti and, and getting your name up in lights, you know, the, the look what I did and look what we did. The systems, this is really when Windows was really gaining its share of the enterprise. So, so Windows exploded uh, and back in those days, you know, I was, I think my first uh, NT4 server was to set up a, a bulleted board, a Wildcat BBS system to talk to people on the internet. Um, and, and what we were focused on the time as far as uh, uh, security was largely infrastructure. So we were, we were focused on locking the doors and locking the windows. We were, we were focused on managing systems and it's really when systems management really started to explode and organizations, because of that Windows uprising, organizations had to do um, a better job and, and increase the, the, the tool set and the capability around inventory, deployment of software and, and, and operating systems, patching vulnerabilities, things like that. And the data also at the time was, was, was all on-premises, right? So it was all in individual data centers you know, throughout, the, throughout the country. In around 2006, 2007, um, the users started a revolution and they, and they, began, to, they began to take over. 
So this this was a big change from 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 IT ruling and that the users started to take over. We started to recognize how many users had administrative privileges either on their local machine or was very uh, were very in doubt throughout the network. The attacks changed, right? So we went from garden variety, you know, amateur hacking to calculated, sophisticated attempts, you know, to exfiltrate information, to hold people hostage, you know, hold assets hostage and things like that. Uh, from the system side, we went from Windows to, you know, we, we went to um, we went to watches. Are we going to, you know, smartphones and 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 tablets? It's you know the the perimeter started to really expand at that point. The 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 infrastructure gave way to uh, protecting information. So locking the doors and locking the windows, it wasn't working. Um, you know, managing the systems, it's helping, but it's still not it's still not getting it done. We realized that we had to put all the information assets in in, in safes and you know classify them and protect the the high value stuff. Um, still a lot of work to be done. And it doesn't mean that we stopped doing any of these things back in the 90s. It's, it's, been, a, it's been a cumulative ride. And then the cloud started, right? So, you know, there were a lot of people that were naysayers that said, oh, the cloud is never going to happen. It's not a thing. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the companies that were handing around, um, uh, uh, you know, device or uh, uh, the little cards that would allow you to go out and, and set up a, a personal you know, Dropbox or a personal uh, zone, even even our friends at Symantec did this, we started the rogue cloud deployment. So once again, you know, to kind of make the point on the users being all powerful, I think the users and people finding a way around the IT controls, especially where they store information, uh, it, it definitely gave way and, and accelerated the growth of, uh, of the first iteration of the cloud. It's insane to me to think that people have had iPhones for almost 10 years now. Yeah. Right? You know, we've gone from having our flip phones with maybe a WAP browser that you couldn't really do anything with to uh, that revolution that, that wasn't because of Apple, but they really accelerated. And, oh, yeah. And the time has really flown here. Yeah, absolutely. The inability to store on those devices yeah. definitely drove it, right? So. So if we look forward now into this year and even into next year, I think the priority between you know where IT has come from and where we have to recognize the users have 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 what they've accomplished. You know we've got to really start responding and saving the organization. We've got to pull out the stops to to protect the organization, to protect customers, to protect employees within these these companies. And you know the 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 these attacks, this notion of attacks or campaigns. I mean now it's everyone's at risk. I talked with a, uh, a a good friend this week who uh, uh, works in a 20 20 person company, and half of their computers were locked up with ransomware this week. So, you know, attackers and the bad guys—they're moving down market. They're moving down into small companies, and um, you know, everyone's at risk. Uh, tax scams—I mean, just it's it's endless. And anybody who's paying attention to what's going on out there, you you know what we're talking about here. So, you know, Windows uprising to you know endless perimeter with all kinds of different devices and smartphones and smart this and smart that. Now we've got, you know, home home security, home automation, um, smart refrigerators, smart cars. We have toys that are talking to our children that are connected to our, you know, our, our, our wireless access points at home. And, and I don't know about you, but, you know, I, I have a problem with, uh, with uh, the world's oldest material girl talking to my kids <laughs> in the way of a Barbie. But this is, this is all happening. Um, protecting infrastructure, uh, protecting information, the inevitability of a data breach, the inevitability of, a, of, a, of, a, of some sort of malware attack or, or targeted attack. You've got to be able to detect these things and respond um, you know, mitigate the impact uh, of these of these uh, inconveniences. The being able to detect and respond to these things that's that's the reality now. So, um, the other thing that's interesting is that the the genie's out of the bottle on the information, right? So now the cloud, we're in this hybrid world where it's happening. Things like Office 365 are perpetuating this. Um, you know what users had had done with. Uh, the data explosion, it's, it's the genie's out of the bottle now. So 
it's uh, there's no going back. We we we're we're, we're between worlds. The data is on prem. There's workloads on on prem. Things are going to the cloud. It's just crazy. And and really, what this represents potentially for IT is this cumulative workload that's just become too much. Many companies have realized. Look, we built IT companies within our, ourselves now. We realize what we're good at and what we're not good at. We may have drifted away from what really drives our core business. And uh, we're looking to figure that out now. So a lot of companies, you know, we're working with a lot of organizations and having this discussion, and they're looking at this list and saying, look, this is, a, this is an area for us where we need to invest further. And in order to do that, it's the age old stops and starts. If I'm going to start doing something else and focusing elsewhere, I need to stop doing something else. And that's where, you know, the inevitability of, of, of outsourcing and uh, getting some help with that comes into play. Yeah, I, I think where this will get real and, and people will realize the risk and, and finally understand that, you know, 10 years out from the first devices, IoT is real. Is, you know, if your kids come and ask you for a copy of your debit card, you, know, you better go check the Princess Castle to make sure you don't have a, a bunch of Ukrainian gangsters talking through the voice box, right? Yeah. I had to question um, my, my, my son the other day on a, uh, a, a Microsoft uh, uh, Xbox charge that wasn't <laughs> authorized. Uh, so just to be safe, you know, he, he denied that he did it, and I believe him, uh, but just to be safe, we canceled that card and ripped that right away from Microsoft, so yeah, yeah that's, that's the world we're living in. So kind of going back to the, you know, to the 90s here and, and this, this, this notion of, of a Windows uprising, um, let's talk about that a little bit. And uh, Troy uh, is joining me here, proud to have Troy here with me. Troy has got a, a lot of experience. As I said, he's a he's he's a leader at, at ITS. He's a peer uh, in the company with me. So I'm going to turn it over to to Troy to talk a little bit about some things that are going on with Microsoft that are relevant. Yeah, thanks, Matt. So you've heard my smooth jazz a couple times here on the microphone. Um, really, what I'm focused on is making stuff work. Uh, I like to often refer to myself as an IT plumber. Um, probably don't see a lot of the things that me and my team build and do, um, especially for our customers, but when it's not working, that's when things, uh, the bad news bubbles up to the top, right? Right. Uh, sort of the, uh, the, the, uh, the theoretical basement floods and you start having information and, and things that don't work and things you don't want to see. Uh, when you start seeing them, that's where, that's where we come in. So let me, let me talk about a couple of things that are happening and, and hopefully I'll give you some insight and maybe even surprise you with a couple of these, uh, these data points. Uh, you know, enter the Windows as a service. This is really something that's catching our customers by surprise and there's a few takeaways I want you to have from our talk today. One, you've heard people probably say something like, this is the last Windows you'll ever deploy, and that really is true. Windows has become a living organism. Uh, you don't know this, but once you adopt Windows 10 in your environment, you've bought a SaaS application. It's desktop as a service, it's Windows as a service, everything that runs on it is a service, it's everything as a service. Um, and you're not really going to get another option around that. And what I mean by that is once you adopt Windows 10 as a platform and you deploy that in your environment and on your devices, the pace and the cadence of your updates is going to, to increase, right? So quicker pace, uh, the cadence moves up, you get monthly cumulative updates, you're getting new features twice a year. Uh, guess what? If you want new features and you want security updates, those aren't mutually exclusive. You have to accept them both. Um, there's actually a, uh, a concern around servicing branches with Windows that, you know, some folks that think they can do one thing or another may not realize this, but there, there's actually a clock and a counter on you um, that once you, you decide to forego a feature update, at some point you will likely start losing security updates. Um, so there's a grace period in there. It's about a year for most servicing branches, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, but you don't get to pick and choose anymore. You got to take all the updates. You got to deploy them as they come in, and you got to keep patching this living organism in near real time because the things that Matt's talking about and all these emerging threats and the outside pressures and, and holes that are opening up in your environment, you simply can't play all the defense, right? We don't have an eight-armed goalie, uh, and we really need one. Um, so we better make sure we buy in the best pads and make sure the helmet's got a good cage on it and those kind of things. Yeah, securing. The, the the endpoint and Windows in this case and that constant dynamic change is going to be a real challenge, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. 
So there's a couple of other complexities you probably want to be aware of. So I've already told you you have to adopt Windows 10 and you have to acknowledge and accept that it's going to be a service and not a thing that you deploy. Uh, there are multiple servicing branches and this is something I like to talk a lot with customers in our workshops and you got to understand what your options are, right? You know, what are your IT pros and your testers doing with insider previews? How is that moving the current branch and how are we keeping cadence with the consumer branch of Windows? What are you going to do with current branch for business and how does that affect your deployment methodology and how are you going to secure and protect that population of your, your end users? And then finally, if you've got your eye on the long-term servicing branch, which is sort of like the pseudo static version of Windows, you're doing it wrong and I would wag my finger at you uh, if you were my customer. There are very few cases in which you're going to want to adopt long-term servicing branch. There are many compromises you're going to have to make to do that. Um, and that's something that you want to talk through in, in a very thorough manner because there's going to be a lot of pain around that and there's going to be some things that you give up. You know, the other component of this is, is Windows actually moves back to being more of a, a mobile end user or a people-centric device, right? I have a Windows 10 device. Uh, I sign in with my personal Microsoft account. I joined our Azure AD tenant and that applied the company's policy and, and security tools to me and, and deployed my apps and configured me, uh, configured them for me. Uh, and what that means is my identity is the control plane, not my device. There's nobody in our IT organization looking for my Surface Pro 3. They're looking yeah. for me. They're looking right. for my identity and they understand that I have a spider web of devices connected to that identity. Uh, and that's really important to understand that the person or the end user is the control plane, not the device. The device is much less important. And Windows 10 is a movement back into the direction of, you know, using a Windows laptop is more like having an iPhone or an Android tablet today. It's not important what it is. What's most important, who's using it, what they need to do with it. Right? Yeah, it's interesting because you know, Apple tried to say that we're in a post-PC era, right? And I don't. I kind of disagree with that. I don't think we're in a post PC era. We're in a. We're a, We're in a. We're in an explosion of everything era. Mm -hmm. PCs haven't gone away. I mean, looking at 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 this desk that we're on, we've we've got a laptop computer. You've got a tablet in that work bag right there. You have a watch on your wrist. You have a phone in your pocket. So, it's the explosion of everything. We uh, we're not in a post PC era where it's 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 everything. Yeah, and I got confidential data flowing to all those devices. So, uh, what you guys on the webinar can't see is in the next room we have an eight-iron goalie trying to swat away uh, all the threats and stop me from leaking confidential company data. And uh, it's a much, much bigger job than it was even 12 or 18 months ago. Indeed. So the final piece of that, and I kind of hinted at this with with data flowing everywhere. You know, Office 365, which we know eight out of ten of our customers are buying and deploying. Um, Microsoft is, has hit a home run with that. Uh, the licensing vehicle is too attractive to say no, uh, but there's some complexity there around how we manage that. And if you've bought Office 365 or subscribed and you've started to allow your end users to self-deploy, you're in a little bit of a quandary that we call the, the click to run chasm. And if you're not managing the deployment of updates today, you probably haven't figured out how to do this. And what you don't know is you're gonna have some tool challenges around that. Um, you can't simply deploy Delta patches to these end users and keep them up to date. If you want to control and manage that and be the conduit for those updates, uh, you've got to redeploy the entire package every month. And so we've got some solutions built around that with our different tool sets. Uh, but if you're thinking to yourself, why is my WAN utilization so high and you're trying to patch Office 365 click to run, I have some answers for you around that. Yeah, sounds like a mess. It is. <laughs> So let's talk about the second component of this, which is really not what you're buying from Microsoft and what you're managing, but, but how you're buying it and why that's important. Um, if you own an enterprise agreement or if you're in education and you own a campus license agreement or some other vehicle, uh, there's a lot of complexity and a lot of smoke and mirrors there. And, and I'm not throwing an arrow at, at Microsoft here. Uh, they have a great system for giving you a pricing vehicle and allowing you to adopt and buy all their solutions. But it can be pretty difficult for more than one person in the organization to know what that means. Um, you know, if, if you're not the VLSC admin or you're not the person who negotiates the EA in your organization, you probably don't know what you own. 
Um, somebody at Microsoft knows. Uh, you may or may not know who that person is, uh, but you have a catalog of things that you've owned that you you own and you've negotiated some price points on, and, and you're probably not adopting all of them. And what's happening now is, uh, I, I guess my advice is uh, just forget about that. Um, you know, the way that you're going to buy is changing. We're moving into the post EA world uh, where you're not going to you're not going to sign a three year contract um, and then hope that you start adopting all the solutions. Microsoft and their sellers are very focused on helping you adopt their technology. Um, all of these things live in the cloud. They've got telemetry. They've got user subscriber information. It's, we're, we're out of the world where Microsoft would sell you something and then hope that you use it. They're going to come in the door and they want to know, what are you going to use and I'm going to sell that to you, right? And so now we're in the world where you're doing subscriptions for um, SaaS applications or other complementary tools things that are running on Azure, Office 365 Suite, and all of its components. Um, so the way that you, you're going to buy those tools is changing. You're going to adopt your Microsoft solutions much faster um, because Microsoft's going to want you to do that. That's how they make money. And your end users are going to be screaming for those capabilities and those productivity tools. Uh, there's no way you're going to buy Office 365 E5 plan and then say, well, we'll deploy it in two years. Your end users are going to demand that it happens now. They're going to want things like Delve Analytics. They're going to want things like, uh, you know, PowerPoint on the web. They're going to want all these different tools that help them do their job, and they're not going to wait for IT to figure out how to deliver them. And if they don't do it, Microsoft's going to come knocking at the door yeah. and give you the pressure as well. Yeah, exactly. And, and frankly, these tools are very consumer friendly, so it's not too hard uh, for somebody in your organization to spin up a tool that they want to use and start adopting it and pumping, you know, confidential data through it and putting your organization at risk uh, because it's just turning knobs and wheels and it's not very difficult, right? Um, so my advice, in, and I think the call to action here is you, you probably have an EA. We know about six out of ten customers do. Uh, most of you are buying subscriptions from Microsoft. To put yourself in an advantageous position and maximize your investment, you want to work with an LSP. And in the Microsoft world, that's some big large account reseller like a Soft Choice or an SHI that can help you understand what you've bought, how to maximize that investment, and what you need to start adopting. Um, so that's our advice around that. Um, we know a lot about that because we interact with a lot of customers, but it's kind of like getting legal advice on Reddit. I'm happy to tell you what you should do, uh, but don't bring me to court with you. So let's shift back here a little bit and let's just talk about what we can do about this, right? Um, you know, I think the world that we're in right now is you don't have to worry about how these vendors are not working together because their strategies and their needs and the way that they're going to go to market to you are aligning together. Everybody's moving to hybrid or public cloud offerings with subscription-based. It's no longer a three-year buy cycle, right? It's an annual subscription. You're not truing up annually, you're truing up monthly. Uh, because all of these tools that you're adopting and that your end users are forcing into your organization through their iPhones and their Android uh, devices and all that, that telemetry is coming in real time. So your software vendors know what you own, they know what you're using, they know how much you're using, they know what you're using it for, um, and you know I think we're stepping out of the, uh, the, the ad hoc post-deployment audit world and into the world where you might get a call from somebody and say, hey, I see that you guys are really stepping up your usage of your Office 365 plan, and I have a great deal for you on the next version of that. Or how'd you like to add this on for only $4 per user per month? Um, so there's a lot of data and a lot of telemetry out there that I think vendors are going to use to apply pressure to you to get you to adopt more. And then obviously those vendors and their, their sales people are, are operating in a manner that, that contributes to that. Um, second thing I want to talk about is you don't have to make mutually exclusive choices when it comes to your vendors and your tool set and don't stick with one thing because that's the way you've always done it or you don't think you can do it in another tool. Pick the best features from the tool of the moment. There's a lot of complementary technology here. There are gaps. There's overlap. You need to work with somebody who can give you some quality advisory to help you understand what that means. Um, but just because one vendor does DLP one way and one vendor does it another, doesn't mean you have to pick a tool. You might be able to adopt both for their strengths 
and maximize your investment in those vendors. And then finally, I've talked a lot about how the subscription model and moving from a three-year to a one-year cycle and the one-month true-up, that's really going to make you more agile anyways, right? If you're buying something on a yearly basis and you need to true-up monthly, you can de-invest where, where it's appropriate. You can create... Um, you can increase your investment where it's more appropriate. Don't feel like you have to work on an annual budget cycle here with these tools. As you move to user-based licensing and these monthly subscriptions from cloud services, it's simply going to make your IT organization more agile, and you're going to have to be because the business buyers in your organization aren't going to wait for you. Terrific. Okay, so let's let's switch back over and and talk a little bit about some specifics around around security. So, along the lines of you know what do we protect? We have we have a we have a big Microsoft investment. We have a big Symantec investment. You know how do we make sense out of that or as an organization? And we've got a lot of customers that we're having that discussion with, and I'm and I'm sure there's others to come. We welcome it. Um, as far as the, the 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 threat side and the management and and endpoint security kind of coming together on the Microsoft side, you know, there's a there was a lot of uh, skepticism or, or questioning around the notion of because if 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 you're paying attention to what's going on with the Microsoft uh, stack, you're aware that the the forefront technology or the the, the Microsoft SCAP is an extension or an add-on, a continuation of of System Center. So the notion of combining, even though from an IT department, we do see a lot of organizations where management and endpoint security are together. There are just as many that are that are separate. Um, so that's kind of evolving, and 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 that's been uh, been been ever changing. And then there's this idea of of kind of a separation of role and duty. Um, in fact, I even spoke with an organization yesterday with a um, a, a CISO for a bank. They have responsibility for patching, and and that kind of caught my attention. Uh, and and you know we dug, we dug into that and talked a little bit about that. And um, and in this occasion, you know normally these would be separate separate departments. They would be separate silos of IT. You'd have the desktop or infrastructure people. You'd have security. Well, patching was moved over to security because you know they 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 had confessed that it wasn't working. You know they were five months behind on patches. And frankly, they were they were concerned about you know the attention that they were drawing uh, potentially on the internet, having all those those vulnerabilities out there and having all those unpatched systems. So you know the separation of role and duty it's it's made things kind of interesting. And once again, it, it lends itself to having that advisor that you can talk to that can come in and look at everything and give you some recommendations based on what our organizations similar to yourselves are doing, or you know what makes the most sense and what would be a best practice going forward. There's also a distinction between you know the larger companies down to the small companies, and as we have learned by a lot of the um, the news out there around breaches and a lot of the statistics, um, Semantics uh, Internet Security Threat Report um, came out this April, Volume 21, and and they show clearly in there that you know small companies are 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 under attack and the bad guys are moving down market. Uh, to those smaller organizations. <clears throat> so, when, if I'm looking at 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 a, if I'm looking at this from a security standpoint, and looking at this from, you know, what are we entitled to? What should we be leveraging from Microsoft? What should we be leveraging, you know, from a from a vendor um, like Symantec? Uh, definitely the size of the organization, and there's some other dimensions in there, not just size, as far as how you're handling other aspects of IT, specifically security. That come into play, and then I also, you know, recommend looking at the industry analysts, right? So looking at who they recommend, um, you know, where the, the 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 testers like Miracom and Virus Total and Dennis Labs, from a threat standpoint, you know, be looking to those organizations to tell you who's got the efficacy rates, who's got the you know the best of breed technology. Um, when I think about the 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 growth of intelligence communities. I do think it takes a little bit of the spotlight off best of breed, uh, but when we're thinking about endpoints and we're thinking about preventing threats where malware breeds and where it propagates and often where it takes a foothold, you do you do still have a good case for best in breed. You have a case for layered security. 
So along the lines of keeping the bad stuff out, we've kind of dipped our toe into the threats. I mean, threats are coming in from everywhere. They're coming in from email. They're coming in from endpoints. They're coming in through through you know through the web, uh, watering hole attacks. I mean, they're they're coming in from from just about everywhere. Um, it seems like the days of you know USB sticks uh, being left out in front of organizations we're we're beyond that. You know, the 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 tactics and the maneuvers are, are different now, and uh, you know, phishing emails. Uh, watering hole attacks, uh, um, uh, infecting you know insecure websites. That's that's really where things are at right now. So the game's changing, and really what you need is is you need those layers not only at the endpoint, uh, but beyond. Uh, it still makes a strong case uh, for for good old defense in depth, um, but you definitely need those layers at the endpoint. So if you're if you're looking at endpoint security and and from that perspective. You, you need more than reputation and behavior. You need, um, you know, you need correlation between different control points and different things so that you're able to distinguish a, a weapon of mass inconvenience uh, from a potentially, you know, sophisticated attempt to uh, exfiltration out or, you know, maybe hold a department or, or uh, uh, a fleet of computers hostage through ransomware. And then once you once you determine that you you do have infections, you need to be able to detect them uh, quickly and identify where and 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 provide some forensics around where where it came in, what is it, uh, what are we dealing with, and then be able to you know to be able to isolate it. Um, and even just comparing you know Symantec and Microsoft as far as what you know there's a lot of trends a lot of acronyms a lot of you know trendy trendy terms right now uh, I believe we're talking about a lot of cyber stuff today cyber this cyber that but in in another five years I think all of this will just be crime it won't be cyber crime but even comparing Microsoft and Symantec um, just from a from an ATP standpoint they're different products they're different things so, you know, a customer asked a few weeks ago, well, you know, we're talking about Semantics ATP, but Microsoft's got an ATP product. They do, um, but they're very different. Um, Semantics is an overlay to their, 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 their Semantic endpoint protection footprint, uh, layering other control points in there, putting some cloud-based sandboxing in, correlation between multiple control points, whereas on the Microsoft side, it's really about preventing east and west movement in a hosted Azure situation. So it's 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 equivalent to if you're familiar with you know both portfolio lines, it's really more um, more akin to Symantec's data center security uh, uh, standard edition, which works on virtual platforms and works with uh, with VMware NSX. So it's more of that you know east west prevention than it is what uh, some of the other vendors are calling a true ATP solution. So there's Definitely some distinction there and, and, and some confusion that's going on. But the bottom line, um, in my opinion, is unless you are a company, maybe on the smaller side, maybe you've transferred risk by moving you know, your information repositories, at least your critical information repositories, um, uh, risky workloads to the cloud, transfer that risk elsewhere, uh, you know, your weapons on the endpoint side, they really, really need to be upgraded. So just some further endpoint security considerations. Again, layers beyond reputation behavior. You need um, you need all this great stuff that's built into the semantic tool and built into some of their tier one competitors. Uh, and again, intelligence is key to be able to take um, to be able to take real intelligence from what's going on out there in the world and what's going on with other companies and with other users. And to be able to correlate that between multiple control points across the organization, that is where the game is. Uh, we've we've gone um, uh, we've gone beyond the the DIY uh, uh, event and incident management that we've been attempting for the last ten years, and buying some sort of sim, you know, including our way through creating the collectors for all the different you know log lines and all the different device types. We say it all the time, and we see it still. Uh, companies are like, "Well, our sim really isn't showing us too much, so I don't think we have that much to worry about." And again, if we're if we're reading what's what's being put out there in the threat reports, uh, if you don't see things in you know your sim today, it's not configured correctly. 
because you you were you're clearly missing it. I think of uh, I think of Mark Twain a lot here. Uh, I'll have to paraphrase, but I think it said you know it's it's not what we don't know that gets us into trouble. It's what we know for sure that just ain't so. <laughs> yeah. Well put, indeed. So, so in addition to intelligence, you know, again, having those advanced technologies, we're big advocates of the semantic endpoint product um, for you know organizations, you know, thousand seats, two thousand seats and up, uh, because they've got some proprietary technologies, you know, that 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 help towards stopping a lot of the advanced threats of today, especially ransomware, right? So, you know, like the 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 sonar. Uh, the download insight. I mean, these are things that are that are again layers beyond the reputation and the behavior that really make a difference when we're talking about staying in tune and staying current with the tactics that the bad guys are are, are employing. So, along those same lines, to be able to you know remediate and and even potentially isolate machines, you know, the the, the days of of walking over and pulling the network cable on something. I mean, there's just no excuse for that. We have technology, and most organizations have got tools either at a network level or at a at a host level, to where if we do get an infection and we do see, you know, malware attempting to communicate out on the wire and call back out or to communicate to other, you know, computers on the on the wire, we need to be able to, with a right click, you know, with a coffee cup in the other hand, isolate that machine. And and we can do that today with uh, with a lot of the great technology that Semantic brings to the endpoint. Yeah, I think you know today it's it's appropriate to recognize that your most vulnerable users are more likely to be off your network than on. Yeah. And their connectivity is likely to be spurious yeah. uh, and unpredictable. So you got to be able to 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 do some command and control in near real time. Um, be able to deploy policy and respond to threats uh, and incidents like that because you you know most likely it's going to be a sales guy or somebody in marketing um, or an intern uh, that does something dumb, clicked on the wrong thing, fell for the wrong trick, uh, and guess what? We got to get to a MacBook Air at a Starbucks uh, somewhere in the middle of Iowa, and uh, we can't get on a plane fast enough to go do it sneaker net, right? Right, exactly. So yeah, and and along that line of of, of layers beyond the endpoint, um, something that the Symantec is bringing to the table with their advanced threat protection offering is um, a couple couple of layers beyond all that great power and capability at the endpoint, and it's correlation between those multiple control points, right? So think of this as as security monitoring specific to those Symantec products. Uh, and then the other piece of this is a cloud-based detonation chamber. So this is you, one of your best defenses against like the zero-day threats, right? Where if we get something that you know is a highly suspicious, um, uh, from comes from a highly su suspicious source or from a you know bad part of the internet, and we haven't seen this file before. And it happens to be a Word document in 2015. You know, where the most malicious uh, email attachments were Word documents. We can, with the ATP product, we can run that down uh, uh, either on bare metal uh, or in a in a in a virtual machine and detonate that and and test that and execute that file and make sure that it's good. Uh, a lot of uh, malware is virtually aware now, so the need to, to not just have virtual capability there, but to actually have physical machines has, uh, has really become a, a, a real thing. So, so a couple of additional layers there, that correlation to kind of demystify and, and show you the, the, the life cycle of the organism in your environment and show that whole kill chain and show you know, that whole chronology of, of where it came in, who did it, how it was, how it was, uh, you know, brought in, and what it's done. That that's where it's at. We need rich intelligence, not just there's a computer infected. It's these computers are infected. This is the website it came from, and now I know what to do about it. So let's switch switch sides a little bit here now. So we're talking about about threat, the bad stuff, and talking about threats. So let's talk about you know why we're trying to keep these things out of the organization, and that's to keep the good stuff in. 
So, you know, encrypting endpoints, uh, uh, data where it rests out on the network and file shares and in unstructured locations, as well as, you know, on the, on the network or even, um, you know, as it leaves the organization through, through the transport, uh, most organizations have figured out they've got to encrypt endpoints. There's still some out there that don't have all their endpoints encrypted. Frankly, I think there's no excuse for it. Uh, I too, Troy, I would wag my finger at someone who doesn't have uh, endpoints encrypted, at least a specific department, because I'm sure uh, there's a good case and a good justification for it. Um, but when we're looking at comparing Microsoft and, and Symantec, you know, you've, you've got some, some, some decisions to make there. If you're talking about really having, you know, thorough management, reporting, different integration, if you don't need those things, you know, you might be able to, as Troy said, use a combination of technologies. Maybe you're using uh, BitLocker at the, at the endpoint because you, don't, you just don't need the management uh, or you don't need the reporting. Uh, maybe at the transport layer or maybe out there on the, on, the, on the storage side of things, you're leveraging a different tool set. So we, know we, do, we, do, we, do, we need to be looking at management, um, you know, the different integration points with other tools. DLP comes to mind, uh, as well as reporting when we're, when we're making that decision and trying to compare that. Along the lines of Office 365, so this is a really, really big discussion that's going on right now in the community. Hey, Office 365, it's got DLP built in it. Okay, it does. Uh, I have the ability to uh, notify people through rights management. And again, Troy's point about the, the user is the new control plane and the identity is the new control plane. So the good news is in a, in a, in a Microsoft world and in this new forward-looking um, you know, Windows 10 environment, the identity is key. Rights management is following the user around and is going to control the access to the information. It's going to control how the information is used. It's going to control how it's potentially shared. And with, within uh, Office 365, there is native DLP in that I can stop you know, confidential or sensitive business information from leaving the organization. I can notify a line of business or I can notify a business owner. I can notify the, the incident handlers or, you know, some sort of uh, uh, team and in, in, in that need to know about a particular incident or maybe a violation of policy. But <clears throat> there is a difference between, you know, that native functionality that is able to do some of those things and what a full enterprise DLP program looks like. And we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit more. So in my opinion, you know, true DLP, DLP it spans the enterprise. It spans just cloud, you know, workloads like, like Office. It, it gets into where data lives. It gets into, you know, physical endpoints and how people interact with that information. Again, we're in a hybrid world. The data is everywhere. So we're trying to do it all. It hasn't all migrated to the cloud yet. So right now we need an enterprise solution. Not only that, but depending on the company, depending on how their, how their organization is laid out um, physically, and depending on what their business is and what they're trying to protect, we need advanced technology to detect. You know, we need exact data matching. We need index data matching. We need you know, machine learning in order to really identify the information you know, appropriately and correctly and accurately in order to keep false positives at a minimum so that we're notified and we're aware of the things we need to know about. And then once we do find something that we need to take action on, we need the appropriate response. We need to enforce encryption you know, without the user having anything to do with that. We need to be able to you know, quarantine in some cases. We need to be able to notify people and, and, and do things in, from an incident management standpoint that go way beyond some of that native functionality in, in Office 365. And then on top of that, because again, we're talking about a hybrid world where the data is everywhere, we're trying to be mindful of everything, having that centralized policy management, that is really, really critical. I don't want to have one approach for, for Office 365 and then one approach for you know, all the rest of my DLP uh, problems. I want to have one, one, one console, especially if I'm a larger organization. Maybe the smaller companies, you know, maybe they, make, they can do it a little bit differently and they can be a little bit more creative. 
But if I have those requirements, if I have the mature IT and I have the requirements, which a lot of them do, you really need that centralized approach. So some rules of thumb here. Um, if I had to, if I had to just put it in some in some salient, you know, terms here. Given everything that Troy shared with us about, you know, subscriptions, the evolution of Windows, what's going on with users, and we've both talked a lot about that. Managing the systems and, and managing mobility with Microsoft makes just a ton of sense. Uh, you know, if we get into talking about, you know, uh, uh, Azure and 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 Active Directory Premium, I mean, it just really makes a strong case for the systems management, mobility, identity. Um, you know, MPKI, those are really, really strong Microsoft plays, and I think organizations are, are positioned to adopt those technologies and, and, and free them up from, you know, some of that mundane work that is very mature. We should be better at, at, at automating this, and we should be better at, you know, giving users what they need today to keep them productive, because, again, they have taken over. But this is IT's chance to say, look, there's got to be a new world here where we get control, we get control back, but we still allow people to work and play freely in this connected world. So crossing over to the semantic side, you know, I'm a firm believer that you really need those layers of protection. You need to be able to defend yourself against threats with, you know, some best of breed technology, and that's where semantic comes in. In continuation of that, same thing goes for, you know, for DLP and having that enterprise coverage. Having one console that, that you know gives you unified policy management, encryption, and this is something that we get into a lot of discussions with customers around is you know hey what about encryption? Encryption's encryption, right? And to an extent, it, it is. I, I with the exception of maybe looking at different levels of encryption. You know, I, I was reading an article the other day about some 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 bad guys that got into a um, got into some 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 proxies or got into some perimeter security uh, uh, appliances and were able to reduce or, or lower the level of encryption that was used so that it could be cracked on the outside. So, you know, they came in, reduced the level of security so that they could they could do something with the information that they were exfiltrating, you know, through that through that egress point. So encryption, um, bigger conversation, but that can potentially be a swing vote. And this is where, you know, how, how we can help, right? So if you're hearing some of these things and you're like, hey, you're kind of speaking my world or you're talking about things that we're talking about right now, that's why we're sharing a lot of this with you because we're, we're doing this with a lot of organizations today. So if you're not familiar with ITS, you know, we, we, are, we are a reseller and an integrator. Um, we offer ad hoc support uh, that's very tactical. Uh, we offer uh, projects that help enable and and empower uh, IT to take over a lot of these projects and these 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 starts, and then we have you know managed services where uh, maybe the organization wants to mature their IT. They want to move upstream to more detection and response. They're looking to to move infrastructure management or systems management, maybe endpoint security. They're moving those things you know off to someone else who's an expert where it is their bread and butter. It is their wheelhouse because it isn't the organization's wheelhouse. They want to focus on what drives the business. Um, and then we can also help you evaluate, once you meet with those LSPs on the Microsoft side to figure out what your enrollments are, we can help compare with what your requirements are and what we see with other organizations to help you make a better decision about what's the right blend of all this great technology and what's the best way for us to work efficiently in this in this new world given this cumulative IT workload? And then looking at your your existing tools, right? So we can even get you know from above the tools down into the tools to assess them with the benchmark of maturity to say, according to the industry or according to vendor best practice, our combined best practice as a as a integrator or reseller of that technology, here's where you stack up. And then here's what a roadmap might look like, right? So here's here's that benchmark. Yeah, and I think you know a lot of customers when they think about this stuff, they might overlook an integrator um, as a source of this type of advisory. You know, you tend to think of a big strategy firm, but 
you know, when I when I want to know how to use a piece of farm equipment, uh, you know, I don't uh, I don't go to uh, Brooks Brothers and ask that guy, right? I might go to the farmer who's got the tool, who's been using it for 20 years, it's passed down through generations, and that's a practical field experience. That I think helps us cut through a lot of the theoretical stuff. And when we do our advisory, we're talking about things that happened and things that we saw, things that we did. And I think there's a lot of value that can be extracted from that. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. We we focus on fewer vendors here for a reason. And it's to be the best and to be to be to be really, really good at those technologies and not just, you know, sell a bunch of stuff. So um, we offer um, a bunch of different uh, insights. Uh, we, we conduct these as workshops where it could be on the entire you know, landscape of a particular area, whether it's endpoint security or systems management, um, and we can put together a, a technology roadmap that, that's right for you, it's right for the organization. So uh, just a, a handful of things where, where we can help. So we are coming up on, on the end of an hour here. Um, we did pretty well on time, Troy, so thanks for your, your participation and help. I think yeah. we've got a, a few questions that have come into the queue. We'll go ahead and take some of these now, um, and then any that we are unable to answer, we will uh, reply to you uh, in an email uh, either later today or, or first thing this morning. So. The first question that we have here, and Troy, this looks like this one's for you. It's um, what is SPE? Yeah, so uh, great question, very timely. Um, something that's just hitting the market now is, is Microsoft's done a little bit of rebranding around some of their tools. Uh, they call this the Secure Productive Enterprise. Uh, just go punch that into your favorite search engine, um, even if it's uh, Lycos, Web Crawler, uh, or Ask Jeeves. Uh, go punch that in. What you're really looking at is a, a sweet combination of a bunch of offerings from Microsoft. It's basically their enterprise mobility and security offering, which is uh, basically uh, Intune, rights management, and um, Azure AD. Combine that with the Office 365 at a sweet level, and then also Windows 10. Um, so again, I, I've talked a little bit today about how you should view Windows 10 as Windows as a service. It really is a SaaS offering. It's going to be bundled as such. Um, those of you that are buying Surface devices may be aware that Microsoft's also launched their Surface um, subscription. Uh, and this is actually something I think is really neat for the, the small and mid-sized business where you can go buy the Secure Productive Enterprise, unpack all your software solutions and tools. You can subscribe to the Surface devices and have the latest. And then you layer on your security tools on top of that from your other vendors, particularly Symantec, um, to kind of help you wrap it all together and uh, make the Death Star fully operational, right? Awesome. So we got a couple other questions here. Uh, we got quite a few, so we're not going to be able to get to them all here in the hour. Um, but I do have one question here, Matt. Um, does Symantec offer identity management software or DLP software to help with stopping the leak of data? Oh, absolutely. So um, I've touched on, on, on the DLP uh, technology. So they definitely have got a DLP software. I mean, go look again. Go check out Gartner. I think it's eight or nine years, uh, you know, the clear leader in, uh, in data loss prevention. They, they also have um, an identity management offering with their two-factor authentication as well as with their semantic access manager. So they have identity management solutions there as well. Um, so yeah, you can you can look into those. Uh, those are solutions that we also will also offer, and um, you know we'd be happy to to talk to you about those uh, should you be interested. Okay. Another question that we've got is um, it's asking about removable media, and I'm assuming this is an encryption question, and this is actually a really good one and potentially differentiating between Microsoft and Symantec in the way of, you know, what, what, what encryption solution is, is right for me. So again, if I'm comparing uh, Symantec to, to Microsoft with, with BitLocker, Symantec is going to give you some robust reporting um, management um, and recovery with, uh, with, with uh, Symantec endpoint encryption. Um, and they do have uh, out, better out-of-the-box removable media support. There's also some really nice integration with DLP. DLP, Semantics DLP does integrate with other encryption technologies, 
but it's it's very seamless and uh, and and very very uh, very nice uh, when you're talking about the semantic solution. So it's no surprise that they would provide you know better integration between their own products. There is integration with uh, some of the other tools. But uh, it definitely stands apart um, when you combine semantic and semantic between DLP and encryption. Okay. Thanks, Matt. So I think uh, we got a few questions rolling here. I'm going to try to combine a couple um, just in the interest of time. So what do you think is the right approach to comparing the antivirus engines or the endpoint protection suites? Um, how, do we, how do we help? Our, our webinar attendees and our customers understand the strengths and weaknesses of the different solutions and, and maybe how to smash them together. Hmm. Well, so again, for me, it, it it's about looking down market at smaller companies. But as we know, um, and the reason I say smaller companies, the so smaller companies almost almost always have more agility than larger mm -hmm. ones do. So if they're waking up based on what's going on out there in the threat landscape and, and if they've even suffered some sort of, you know, incident or some sort of, you know, ransomware attack, they're probably reeling from that saying, okay, you know, I need to get off, get up, you know, get off all this technology and figure out what I'm, what I'm doing to really stop this stuff. So again, I got to go back to harping on, on the different layers of protection. Those things are there for a reason. And, um, Unless you are an organization that has got that risk transferred to where they they may not need to leverage all, all the different layers in an endpoint security product, if you're more than a thousand seats, you should really probably be looking looking beyond the Microsoft technology or solving it elsewhere. You could be solving it elsewhere in the network. You could be solving it and protecting the information. But if you don't have those assurances in those other areas, you're 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 going to be you're going to need to look at more of a of an industry recognized, you know, endpoint security solution that gives you all those layers, that gives you that advanced technology, and positions you, you know, to kind of go forward in the future. Okay. Well, here we are at the end of the hour. Um, so, a couple of other questions just uh, about the webinar. We will publish the deck. Um, questions that were received, uh, we will answer and send those out to all attendees. Um, so, be looking for that in your inbox. Um, any questions? We've got some contact information up here on the page. Matt, any closing thoughts? No, oh, thank you very much, everyone, for attending, and uh, we will see you on another uh, ITS webinar. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.